They say 80% of success is showing up. And sometimes that can be really challenging, like facing rejection, facing uncomfortable conversations. I think it extends, this idea of showing up extends to just talking to the person next to you. At the end of the day, that's what college, the 90% of the value I got from college was not what I learned. It was from talking to the other people in the room that became my peers, became friends, became people that I invest in today, people that I do business with today. Microphone check, one, two, what is this? You're now listening to a brand new episode of the Play Big Faster podcast. Look what you done started. Let's go. Welcome to another episode of the Play Big Faster podcast. We are joined today by Parker Harris. Parker is an entrepreneur and a mastermind of mastermind. Parker, welcome. Thank you, Sheree. Sometimes I hear the mastermind of mastermind things, and I want people to be clear that what I mean is there's something called a mastermind, which is a group of people that come together to solve problems and maximize opportunities together. And it's something I've been doing for 13 years of my life now, and I've facilitated thousands of them. So I don't consider my, and there's also a mastermind that's like a brilliant genius. And I don't consider myself the geniuses of all geniuses. Let's talk about the former. Let's talk about your business and your mastermind. So masterminds, I think, when as I've do dove down this rabbit hole, they've been around for thousands of years. Often good ideas don't come from a single individual, but it's often a collaboration of people coming together. One of my favorite movies, Amazing Grace, is about a mastermind coming together to abolish slavery in, in England. And it was like one person that was really passionate about it, but he was unable to do it on his own, but through having different people come together, they were able to solve this like, like a bigger problem. And I think it's, I th when I look back on American history and some of the ideas that created this unique blend of government where there's checks and balances and different structures of government, those came out of a mastermind that started in the 1720s by a guy named Benjamin Franklin, who I was inspired by, where our idea of Junto came about. He started Junto in 1727. He called it a club for mutual improvement. And they came together to discuss business and science and technology and philosophy and things that were of interest to them. And everyone in the group was able to experience a great amount of success because they learned and helped each other. And, and then the ideas continued to grow and have a bigger impact on their community and the nation as well. So it's interesting how masterminds I think it's I think it's one of those things that really successful people, wealthy people, powerful people, leaders are a part of that is in my opinion the future of the education system as well. I think it's a good space for people to figure out who they are, to find their voice, to figure out what's really holding them back because often it's not something that is known, like it, it's the unknown. Because most people, when they know what the problem is, they're able to solve it themselves, especially with the internet and all the tools and free information that's available. But sometimes it can be really challenging to figure out what is the problem that's actually holding me back from accomplishing my goal. Yeah, I joke with my friends sometimes, if I have a question, then I'm going to go to Google University and see if Google can help me figure it out. But when I'm unable to Google the answer, how do I even know what type of mastermind I need to look for? Yeah, I love that. I, I respect the fact that you go to Google University first. <laughs> I, I joke around that masterminds are relevant to people when their problems are no longer Googleable. How do you figure out what... So a mastermind is, is an opt-in thing where it's people that are there for a reason, right? There's so many things that we could be spending our time and energy on just whether it's just continuing to work, whether it's be healthy, spending more time with our loved ones, our family, our friends. So people that want to show up for something like that, there's something that's like special and weird and unique about those type of people on their own. And before I built my business, I worked at a large Fortune 100 company and I was in like finance and operations and strategy. And at one point I got to see that the CEO of our company, he invested $250,000 a year for his mastermind. So there's these masterminds exist at all levels. And at a certain point, 
you'll probably be invited into it. <laughs> and I think that point is usually when we're doing something big enough, you know, to, to the point of this podcast, when, when we're out there, where we're taking action, when we're solving our own problems and we're achieving a certain level of success and impact, usually the knock will come. There's a kind of a joke that when the student's ready, a teacher will present themselves. I think it's the same with masterminds. Often in different environments, whether it's at a conference or a networking event or you know, different professional development events, there's, a, there's circles within circles. And so people that come to really contribute and are like go-getters and there's nothing that can really stop them and they're actually even trying to help other people succeed Th those are the type of people that like other people want to help those people right because there's so much leverage that happens and on, on, the, on the reverse side of that too there's also some like challenges and problems that plague society things like addiction as an example like alcohol addiction or drug addiction and there's masterminds for those, right? And they're very well known, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous and there's something called self-management and recovery training. And these are different like peer-to-peer -peer environments with people that have the same type of problem come together and they're vulnerable with each other. There's a certain level of trust and something happens in those environments where there's like healing and like an activation of wisdom. And I'll be frank is my mastermind journey started in those type of environments. <laughs> And I got, I was like, wow, this is really powerful. This type of connection, there's something deeper here. And science is starting to catch up to what it is. It's called epigenetics. And it's the, this field of study where our environment impacts the translation of our DNA. It explains like the paradox of nature and nurture. Some people are always like focused on the genetic side of things or on the nurture side of things and like the environment side of things. And there's something about the space that we put ourselves in and the impact that it has on us as an individual on the cellular level. I, I think it goes back to solving our own problems. And if the problem for me at one point was addiction, I solved that problem in a mastermind environment. And then at a certain point, I was really committed to school and success and learning. And it, I found my way into different extracurricular activities in, at my college where I started taking on leadership roles and the leadership role that I was most interested in was bringing in speakers to speak to the students. So I'd bring in entrepreneurs or investors and executives and that created a lot of opportunity for me, a lot of networking and, and again, people want to help people that are trying to add value to other people. A lot of, I got a lot of job offers through the, through taking on those leadership roles companies that wouldn't even interview me or talk to me a year before when I was just focused on myself. And then after doing a number of those speaker events, I was like, I was getting less and less value from them because I just heard the patterns of success, but I was getting more and more value from the conversations at the beginning and the end of those events. And, and so I was like, you know, what if I just invite these, these people that are willing to show up to this type of environment to a mastermind conversation? So I started my mastermind for myself and over time I realized that there there's other organizations that have been doing this for a long time that we can learn from and, and also participate in. So, so I'm what, not sure that answered your question. Oh, definitely. It did. It definitely did. So what type of mental models are available or useful for entrepreneurs who are considering a mastermind? Mental models are often, so a mental model, or I, they're also called frameworks, is a multidimensional idea where principles are combined together to create a, a significant expansion of knowledge. So it's a way of, it's like almost a way of looking at the world. I, saw, I got exposed to my first one when I was 17 in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And it's a, it's a two-dimensional mental model where there's circle of influence and then there's circle of concern. And it's a circle within a circle. And the idea is, in his book, he argues that successful people spend 80 to 90% of their time in their circle of influence, things that they can actually control or change or do something about. And unsuccessful people spend 80 to 90% of their time in their circle of concern. So the news, <laughs> they're worried about the world, the world, things that they can't control, but maybe are concerned about. So 
that was the first one for me. And then as I entered college, I took a psychology course and there was a guy named Abraham Maslow who created Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, which is a framework around human needs and how they start with really basic needs. And then they grow into more like societal and connection needs and esteem needs and success needs. And so there's different there's survival. I think it actually is dependency first, dependency level, then survival, then success, and then self-actualization. And some people argue there's a stage after self-actualization. So that's, those are two mental models. When, and what's cool about them is you can stack them on top of each other. So it's, oh, I'm going to focus my time on getting out of dependency and focusing on my survival needs. I'm going to then focus my time on my influence on the success level needs. There's people that invest a large period of time, and I'm talking about decades, to solve a really complicated problem or question. For example, what is a company that performs 10 times better than their peers over 10 years? What do they do differently? That's an example. I think Jim Collins asked that question with a few other researchers and it took him 10, 15, 20 years to find the answer to that question. And he wrote a book about it called Good to Great. And in that book, he created a framework called the Hedgehog Principle to answer that question. So the reason why I share that example is people that really commit to solving a really complicated question, a really important question for a long period of time, they usually create a framework or a mental model to answer that question and there's mental models for everything there's mental models for for humor for like how to be funny there's like a mental model there's a mental model for storytelling a guy named joseph campbell created it i think in the 40s or 50s and hollywood took that mental model and they created star wars and basically every movie follows this hero's journey framework so mental models can be quite powerful in and helping somebody accelerate their wisdom and knowledge versus just like memorizing something and like trying to remember it. It's like a way of looking at the world in a different way. Last thing I'll say about it is there's a really powerful and successful management consulting firm called McKenzie and Company, which is, I think, the most successful and both financially, their team is huge. I think it's tens of thousands of employees all over the world. And when they hire someone, they ask them very difficult questions and the questions that can't even be answered. How many windows are in a hundred story building that has all these dimensions? No one can really answer that question. I don't think, like I wouldn't be able to answer it, but they're trying to look for people that are trying to answer a difficult question using a framework versus just making something up on the fly. That is so good. So when you self created Junto Global. What was the plan? Was it that you're going to start out with a six month model? Is it ongoing? Tell us a little bit more about your specific company. Yeah. So I started Junto for myself, not as a company initially. It was, it wasn't really a plan around it. It was just, it was more like I graduated college and I was missing the environment to continue to learn and meet people that I really enjoyed connecting with. So myself and a close friend organized the first meeting. It's supposed to be like 12 or 13 years ago. And we only got four people to show up. And we invited 20 or 30 people. And they're like, why would we come if there's no speaker? And it was like, just trust me. It was a Friday evening at 6 p.m. So many other places to be. And people came together and it was a really amazing conversation. We all, something happened in us. It wasn't just like learning something or some sort of like kumbaya emotional feel. It was, I think, moving from knowledge to wisdom is a really interesting thing because a lot of people know something, but they don't apply it. And I think there's something funny that happens when we teach someone something is when one person teaches, two people learn. The person that receives as well as the teacher benefits from that teaching often. And the next meeting, we had five people. The next meeting, we had six people and we just slowly started adding people because the word got out that this was a great experience. And then over time, more people were in the group than we could really facilitate in a single meeting. So we started cutting people. We're like, all right, who's not adding value? <laughs> and I'm not proud of this looking back. <laughs> and one of the youngest members, I think he was the youngest member. He was still in college. He was 20 years old and he's super sharp, like 
incredibly successful today. He was the CEO of 80 employees, 100 employees, just crushing it. And at the time, he was the president of the Entrepreneur Society at SDSU. And it didn't have a lot to offer wh where we were at, but he was, he listened. Anyway, so I went to him and I was like, I think, I think we're going to be making a change. And, <laughs> and I don't even remember how I said it anymore, but it was, a, it was an uncomfortable conversation. And he was like, Parker, I've gotten so much out of this. He'd probably been in it for a year and a half. I've gotten so much out of this. And I think I know some other people that would benefit from this type of experience. Would you help me start a second group? And I was like, you know what? If you'll get the people, I will help you start it. And so we started a second group and then a third group. And so it started to morph organically. And we created a, like a process for joining. We instituted a membership fee that was like way too low at the time <laughs> and just started making mistakes, figuring out what we were doing. We didn't really know what we were doing and started to steal and copy and do some R&D around how to create this experience better. And over over a 10, 11 year period, it's morphed to become a really personal experience, a customized experience that adds a lot of value to individuals, specifically entrepreneurs and leaders that are interested in being successful in their business, their relationships and their health. Just based on your years from working with masterminds and your own businesses, what do successful entrepreneurs do differently? I think there's a lot of different answers to this question. The first one that comes to mind is the ability to think accurately about the problem that they're dealing with and not, I call it standing in paradox. So there's something called a paradox, which is two contradictory ideas that are somehow both true. I'd like to provide an example to you. Let's come back to the example. But paradoxes, it's interesting now that I pay attention to paradoxes, how many of them there are in life. And, and I think most people want to, in their head, be right and want a simple explanation of why things are the way that they are. And so they'll often come on one side of the paradox. So they'll be like, oh, it's this way or it's this way. But somehow it's both ways. But so as a leader, as an entrepreneur, they're often standing in, in that paradox and able to see both sides of it. And instead of judging one side as right or wrong, they're communicating, they're trying to communicate <laughs> to people both, how both sides work together to create truth, right? That is a really powerful thing. I think it's not just entrepreneurs that need to do that. It's leaders in general need to stand in paradox and somehow see how these contradictory ideas both work together and respect both sides of that. There's so businesses are problem generating machines. <laughs> they just create problems. And so I think entrepreneurs are good at dealing with problems in a way that doesn't kill them. <laughs> that I don't want to say laughing at the problems. Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and some of these, the great entrepreneurs of our time, they call entrepreneurship or they describe entrepreneurship as chewing on glass and staring into the abyss. And it's, holy crap, who would sign up for that? And so it's a really weird group. Of, it's like a we really weird person that's willing to suffer a lot to solve a problem for somebody else and risk failure at a 90% failure rate, which is like crazy. Think about get, like going to school and taking a test and getting a 10%, right? That would be the worst thing ever, right? Wow. So that's why I don't think that the normal school system prepares people for entrepreneurship very well because the relationship with failure and rejection and, and that whole thing is, it's like, it's backwards. Where entrepreneurship failure is celebrated, it's actually necessary. Success is on the far side of failure. Where in school, it's like the different direction. <laughs> it's like, oh, you can choose success or failure. Which one do you want to be? Where it's not entrepreneurship is like, and then success somewhere on the other side of that. If they work hard enough, if there's enough perseverance, if there's enough intelligence and good judgment, there's so many things that could go wrong. And to have all of that happen and not mean that I'm a loser or that I'm a failure, there's some like pretty strong psychology and mindset that goes into something like that. 
there's so many different types of entrepreneurs now too, right? There's solopreneurs, which people that don't have any employees. There's people that have small teams and like boutique lifestyle type companies. And then there's there's bootstrap companies, there's venture. There's so many things. I, I think at the end of the day, entrepreneurs, one of the things that makes entre successful entrepreneurs different is that they enjoy adding value to other people. And most people, I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think most people are only interested in solving their own problems and want to do as little as possible to get the most that they can. And entrepreneurs generally think slightly different around that. I think there, there is this desire to create leverage and have one hour of input equal 100 hours of output, but it takes a while to get there. And most people never get there. And somehow that's okay. Well, Parker, if you had one piece of advice that you can give to entrepreneurs on how to play big faster, what would it be? It's hard with only one, but I'll just say show up for life, right? There's, there's something that, you know, 80, they say 80% of success is showing up. And sometimes that can be really challenging. Like I'm traveling tomorrow. I've, I have a workout session right after this. I, part of me didn't well, wanted to reschedule this. I actually went to reschedule and there wasn't another opening until April. <laughs> And so I was, I just, I decided to show up and I'm really glad that I did. So I think that there's been so many, yeah, I actually had a mentor who's a very successful, he's worth tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, really interesting guy. And he's everything I have achieved in life was because I showed up to things that I didn't need to show up. For. And I think that there's something there, right? Where it's really, there's so much dopamine that we can get by just staying home and watching TV and playing video games and eating unhealthy food and drinking and doing drugs. And there's just, there's so many feel good chemicals that we can get without even showing up and showing up often involves like facing rejection, facing uncomfortable conversations. I think it extends this idea of showing up extends to just talking to the person next to you. At the end of the day, that's what college, the 90% of the value I got from college was not what I learned. It was from talking to the other people in the room that became my peers, became Junto members, became friends, became people that I invest in today, people that I do business with today. And I try not to judge this too much because I'm sure some people are doing building relationships on their phone as well. But there's something about like turning the phone, like just putting the phone down and talking to the person right next to you because that person probably has a lot in common with you because they're at the same place in the world at the same time. Like that's, there's a lot of energetic similarities if someone is at the same place at the same time as you. And I, I'm traveling the world for two years with my wife and we're in a new city every month. And it's interesting, like just talking to random people. And sometimes that unlocks a whole new aspect of life or a whole set of new experiences or new things that I would have never knew, known or learned about. And sometimes it's like a really negative encounter. <laughs> and I, if it's negative, laugh it off and just be like, that's not my person. <laughs> and three out of 10 times, that can be a relationship that can change the trajectory of your life. How can people contact you if they want to learn more about masterminds or entrepreneurship? Cherie, I am active on all social medias except for TikTok, which I'm probably going to crack in the next week or two. Yeah. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, my full name is Zachary Parker Harris. I go by Parker. So they can find me on as Zachary Parker Harris on those channels. And then I'm more active on Twitter today. My handle is Zach, Z-A-C, Parker Harris. And I'll make sure I'll include those links in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome, Cherie. Thank you for having me on. Until next time. Play big faster. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode and remember to play big faster. 